I welcome you, my brothers and sisters, um, <clears throat> to this uh, sharing that I want to make, which is a continuation of uh, the previous teaching I had on um, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. Really, we are concerned with understanding who God is, um, but because historically, when you trace the understanding of uh, the understanding of God um, in the history of the church, you see that a lot of heretical teachings arose from people either claiming that Jesus was only divine and he appeared to have a human body. He was not really human, which means they deny that the word became flesh, truly a human being like all of us. There were such heresies. Then they, on the other extreme, there were those who claimed that he was only a man, not God. Yes, he had some divine qualities, but he was just man. You see that. So you got these two extremes where people claim that he is only divine. He appeared to have a human body, but it was not really a, a human body. Uh, on the other hand, you have those who claim that he was only a man, not really God. So this is the reason why you find some of the strongest statements made in the word of God in describing, in explaining the nature of Christ Jesus. Now, we will try to explore these things. We will take quite a long, long time exploring um, the nature of God, who God is, and particularly focusing on Christ Jesus. Now, in the previous in the previous um, installment, I did focus on Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. Um, and my particular attention was on verse 6. Now, in verse 6, there are a number of things that are established. The first thing I established is that Christ Jesus is eternal because it is said if you read from verse 5 you should have the same attitude or mind toward one another that Christ Jesus had who though he existed then I said when they say which Christ Jesus had we must understand when did he have that mindset. According to the book of Revelation, the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. Really, it means that God's redemption plan was set in motion, or at least was, was God had a plan well before he created anything, he foreknew that man was going to sin, man was going to fall into the mud of sin, and man would need a savior. And so from before the foundation of the world, the, most, the, 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 the plan of redemption was complete. It was waiting for the fullness of time to manifest. So Christ Jesus made that decision, that voluntary decision, that attitude, which, which the apostle is talking about, he made that from eternity. Now then, I, I touched a lot on the word existed. I said, if you, if you read the original text, the word existed here is not talking about some form of existence that was true up to some point and then ceased to be. It really talks about a continuing existence. In other words, he has always existed in that form of God. 
And then I touched on the word form. Now the challenge is when you, when you hear the word form, what comes to your mind could be, for example, uh, that he had a likeness to God, but he was not really God. That's how other people interpret this word. But the word form here refers to that unchanging substance which remains the same from eternity to eternity. In other words, he, exi he existed in the being of God, or in other words, his being, his true nature, his unchanging nature was that of being God. That's what that means. He has always been God. He always existed as God. It's not like he, he became exalted at some point and then assumed some qualities of God. He has always been God from eternity to eternity. Now, then the, 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 the second part of verse 6 says, he did not regard equality with God. Now, the idea of equality close links to the, to the idea of form of God. Because once we say that Jesus Christ's being has always been that of God, in other words, he has always been God from the beginning. Therefore, equality with God, in this case, God, where it says he did not regard equality with God, he's really talking about God the Father, right? Did not regard equality with God the Father as something that should be clinged to, that should be seized by force, something that should be held on to with this fear that I might lose it. He did not regard it like that because he has always been God. So there is no fear that you're going to lose your divine nature by, by becoming a man to come and redeem people. Because he did not lose that essential quality of being God when he came to the earth. He has always existed in that form. That's the unchanging form. So even if he appeared, he manifested in the world of fallen men as truly a man. He was also truly God. So he still had his divine nature in its fullness. That is even why the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 2 says, chapter 1 and chapter 2 says, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily, which means as he was in the flesh, walking on the earth, he was fully God. He was not a fraction of God. He was fully, fully, fully God. Only that he was also man, the God man, right? Now, <clears throat> So therefore, the idea of equality as tells us that here, Jesus is not the Father, and the Father is not Jesus. The mystery, however, is that they are one God in every sense. I'm not teaching two gods here. But there are two persons who are one. That's what this verse is showing us. Now, so what I want to do today is to take this a step further. We are still discussing uh, this Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 5. And I, as I had indicated earlier, I'm taking it a little bit down, maybe up to about verse 8 or 9. Now, Let's read again from verse 5. You should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus heard, who though he existed in the form of God, that he always existed 
in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by looking like other men, and by sharing in human nature. I'm going to stop here. My focus, therefore, will be on verse 7, building on what I discussed previously, uh, looking at verse 6. A recap again, he has always from eternity existed as God. Jesus is not a created being. Sometimes you hear people saying, oh, God first created Jesus before he created anything. Then he used Jesus as a template for creating the rest of the creation. That is not what the scripture says. So, so we must be guided by scripture, not by theories. And the issue of equality here clearly shows you that there's a distinction of persons. Now, don't confuse the issue of persons and the issue of oneness of God. God is one, but he manifests as three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These are the personas through which he manifests. Now, verse 7 says, He emptied himself. Now, let's pause there a little bit. He emptied himself. Of what did he empty himself? That's the biggest question. Now, traditionally, people have said he emptied himself. That is at least some that I have listened to. They said he emptied himself of his divine nature. That's what some people say. Uh, and so, which means when he was on earth, he was just a human. It goes, it now links with that heresy, which just says he was a man and a man alone. He was not God. And that would be incorrect because we said in verse 6, he continued to exist in that form of being God. There is never a time he was not God. There is never a time he was not in that form because that is his, his nature. His unchanging nature is that of being God. He is always divine. So, so whether he manifests as a man, whether a spirit or whichever form he, he chooses to manifest, even if he comes as a tree, this is just a wild example, his divine nature will not change. Do you understand? He's always divine. So it means when it says he emptied himself, it doesn't mean that he ceased to be God. If you interpret it like that, you are missing the point. There is something that he missed. There's something that, sorry, that he emptied himself of. What is it? What he emptied himself of were the divine manifestation, the manifestations of his divine nature. So, so being divine, that is being God, is seen by the manifestations of his glory. So when you look at the entire Old Testament, people knew that God is here. How? by some visible manifestations of his person, manifestations of his glory, of his power, of his majesty, and all those things. So what he's saying is that Jesus Christ emptied himself of those privileges of his divine nature. And so while he was 
in the human board being one of us, like us, to redeem us. There are certain prerogatives, certain privileges of being God, which he was not exercising. Not that he could not. He could have if he wanted. But because he was fulfilling this role of a servant by, by emptying himself and becoming a man, he, he chose not to exercise those prerogatives. So that's what it means to empty himself. Now, notice, this is what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians, where he says, he became poor that we may be rich. He is not talking about economic poverty there. Uh, people like to, to stretch that scripture to that, but that's not what he's talking about. When he was in the heavens, before he came as, as a man, that is, before the word became flesh, he had all the divine privileges, the manifestations of the glory, the authority he exercised, everything else that he exercised. Now, when he chose to become the second Adam, the last man, that is, he really became a human being who was God also. Because his divine nature doesn't change. He still has his divine nature. There are certain privileges he voluntarily chose not to exercise by becoming a man. That is what he emptied himself of. He did not empty himself of his divine nature. He emptied himself of all those privileges of his nature as God. So that now he is born as a helpless babe in the manger. He is persecuted by fallen and sinful men. He is misunderstood. He is exposed to the elements of uh, this universe. He is hungry like us. He feels tired like us. You know, all the sorrows of humanity are upon him. And indeed, for example, when they were trying to arrest him, he, to arrest him, what did he say? If I wanted, I could just summon legions of angels from heaven to fight for me. But I came for this hour to suffer to redeem mankind. So, so you see, there are privileges he has as God, which he forewent, which he chose not to exercise. This is what I'm trying to tell you. That's what he emptied himself of. He did not empty himself of his God nature. There are people who teach that he emptied himself of his God nature. So, so to, to, to leave all those privileges and become weak and become a servant and become somebody who is misunderstood, who is persecuted from city to city, and, and become vulnerable. He made himself vulnerable to fallen men he had come to save. That, that, that omnipotent God entering this existence of vulnerability is what Paul is describing as he became poor because he emptied himself of all the divine privileges, the glories of being God. That's what it means. And nothing else. It's not about economic poverty because by being a carpenter, in fact, the trade he had when he was in, 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 the, in, in the Jerusalem community, he actually was part of the middle class. He was not poor. He was not counted among the poor. This has nothing to do with poverty in the sense of economic poverty. So he emptied himself of divine privileges that he exercised with the Father. 
That is why the last verse we read last time, John 17 verse 5 said, Father, I have glorified you in the earth. Now glorify your son together with you, with the glory which I had with you before the creation of the world. There it is. In other words, when he came into the world, there's something else he lost. Uh, lost is not the correct word, but to make the point clearer, let me use it. Something he lost, that is something he forewent, something he sacrificed, something he could not exercise if he had to achieve the mission of redemption. And that is the glory he shared with the Father before the founding of the world. So now he has accomplished the mission of redemption. He says, Father, glorify me with that glory which I always shared with you from, or from before the foundation of the world. That's exactly what MTD is talking about. It is that glory. Now, He's going to, 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 to have that glory again. Here it was veiled in the flesh. Now it's going to be manifest. He even says that in Matthew and in other places, you shall see the Son of Man in his glory sitting on his throne. In other words, he's saying, now you misunderstand me. You just think I'm a man. You just think I'm, I'm just Joseph and Mary's son. You can't see that I am the creator. I am the owner. I am the heir of the universe. God created the universe and everything in it by me and for me and through me. This is what scripture says. So he owns the universe. He was the agent of creation. He was the means by which God created everything. And he is the heir of all those things. But now people couldn't see all those wonderful things about him. This is exactly what emptied himself means. Now, let's move to the next part of verse 7. I will read verse 7 again. But emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave. Now, let me pause there. Notice this clause which says, by taking the form of a slave. The word form there is exactly the same word used in verse 6 as form of God. In verse 6, he says, who though he existed in the form of God. Here in verse 7, by taking on the form of a slave. The word form in both verses is morphe or morph, whichever pronunciation is correct. Morphe or morphe or morph, right? It means a real substance that does not change. The, the real nature of something, the real nature of something. So verse 6 and 7 put together is are telling us that he was truly, truly and fully God. And he became truly, truly a slave of God. He took that form. He really became a slave of God. He entered into a state of saving. He voluntarily subjected himself to save us. So, so, he took the form of a servant. Even if in other, in other settings he was the agent of creation, that is, God created things through him, by him. 
That's that's what, for example, Hebrews and Colossians say. They use by and through, right? As well as for him, right? Now, even if he, we know of all those others, here what the apostle is saying that he really became a servant. He became a slave of the father. A slave in the sense of how the apostles use the word, the Paul, the bond slave of Jesus Christ. So it's 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 a slavery relationship of love, not one of exploitation. It's one driven by love and voluntary uh, submission. <clears throat> now here we go. So that's why Jesus said, for this reason. The Son of God or the Son of Man did not come to be ministered to, but he came to serve and to give his life a ransom for mankind. He really came as a slave to fulfill the wish of his father or the will of his father, which was to serve mankind. So the word form there is very important. It really means that Jesus became a true, true human being in the fullest sense of the word. He became truly human while he was also truly God. According to verse 6, he became a tr truly a human being according to verse 7. Now, so this destroys the argument of those who follow the teachings of or, or the Aryans in general, those who claim that he was just a man, not God. He was a God, not the God. That's what they say. But these verses are showing us Jesus is a very God of very God. He is divine in every sense. But he also became truly a human being. There's no question about it. Now, let's continue. By taking on the form of a slave, I was emphasizing the word form there. By taking on the form of a slave. Now, just for a moment, look at the word slave and convey it to the word emptied. Now, remember, he is Lord of Lords, Prince of the Kings. He is the King of Kings. He is worshipped in heaven, the Holy One of Israel. He is worshipped in heaven by millions and millions and millions and millions of innumerable angels who worship him in heaven. But he became a slave. That's the emptying. That's the emptying. Taking the state of humiliation. This is his humiliation, his self humiliation. Entering the state of being a servant. Even if he had everything. Even if he was wholly divine and is worshipped in heaven, flawless, perfect worship in heaven. But he left all that. Come into the world in the form of a slave, truly a slave, because of you and me that he may be a ransom for mankind. What does the Apostle Paul teach in Romans chapter 3? Who was appointed by God to be a propitiation for sins through his blood? Here are the two purposes why he became slave according to Romans chapter 3 verse 25 and 26. 
so that God could declare his righteousness. That is, God the Father had to declare his righteousness because in times past, he did not punish sin as it ought to be punished. But having a long-suffering heart with fallen men, forbearing with them, he did not punish their sin. And so the accuser of the brethren was always accusing God of being unjust. You said you will punish sin. No sin will go unpunished, but you are not doing it. But when the fullness of time had come, he who was appointed to be the propitiation, to be the atonement, to be the necessity, that is Jesus Christ. All the wrath of God against sin was emptied upon him. He suffered beyond what you and I can ever understand or imagine. All the wrath of God against sin was spent on him. In the words of Isaiah, all the arrows of God were spent on him. He was buffeted by the arrows of the anger of God against sin. The second reason why he was appointed a propitiation, first is to declare the righteousness of God, that truly he will punish sin, no sin will go unpunished, and he did it in Christ. Secondly, to declare again his righteousness, so that it can be clear to everybody that God is just and he is the only one who can justify the ungodly if they believe in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of God. Blessed be our Father and Savior, Jesus Christ. He became a slave. Now, let's finish that. It says, by taking on the form of a slave, by looking like other men. Now, here is something very important. <clears throat> the last, the last, the, the second last clause there says, by looking like other men. Or if you re if if I can read from the New American Standard Bible, it says, being made in the likeness of men. Now, the word likeness is, is different from the word form, which was used referring to him as a bond servant, and form, which was used of him as in the form of God. So now, form is the word morphe, which really means the unchanging nature, the being of somebody. He has always been God and will continue to be God. There is no question about that. But he also truly became a servant. Morph, morphe, 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 morphe. So morphe of God, morphe of a slave. Those two things. He really became those things. But here it says, and being made in the likeness of men, or according to the New English translation, by looking like other men. Here is something that we need to pay attention to. He is looking like other men. Now, someone here can easily erroneously teach that so he was not truly a man. He was just like other men. But now the word likeness here in the original text is schema. It talks about the outward appearance, the, the outward appearance. So his outward appearance truly was that of a man. He looked like all of us. And 
deep inside in terms of the human nature yet he was also truly human that is form of a bond servant there he truly became a man but why does the bible says likeness of man now i have heard countless times beloved brethren teaching that jesus was unique at some point but once he came into the world, died on the cross, and we, we, we got born again, he is no longer the unique son of God. Now, that is a little bit misleading because likeness of men here truly tells us that he was a man but there are certain things that were different between him and us other men. What was the difference? The difference is that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. That's the first point. It's a very essential doctrinal difference. You can't run away from it because it has many implications. He was born of a virgin, which means the human nature he had was not a fallen nature like the one we have. He was truly human in every sense. He had a body, he had a soul, he had a mind, he had feelings, he had everything, but all of his instincts and feelings and everything were holy. They were not corrupted by sin. He had that very human nature that Adam had before he fell into sin. That's, that's the humanity Jesus had. So by being born of a woman without a father, the original sin of Adam could not have been passed to him because he didn't have a human father. So Mary was the channel through which he got his humanity and could manifest into the world as a human being, and indeed a son of David and or a son of Abraham. So he was truly a human being with a, a real human tribe and with a real um, um, forefathers, right? Having said that, so the nature that Christ Jesus had was a nature which was not fallen. It was the true human nature that God gave Adam before sin entered into the world. So he is unique. He is the new humanity. We are the old humanity, the fallen humanity. Now, but he came to so that we can inherit from him that new humanity through the processes that the word of God and the spirit of God and his blood work upon us. Now, so he was like us in that sense, but he was not truly like us in the sense of having sinful flesh, having a sinful human nature. His was not sinful. So, so he looked like us truly in every sense. Born like all children, drinking milk, suckling like all children, crawling, being winged. He also had a trade as a carpenter. He, had, he needed friends like all of us. Um, there are times he became sorrowful. There are times he became so joyful like all of us. There are times he felt tired and he slept. There are times he felt angry like all of us. He was in every sense 
a true human being, but his humanity was not the fallen humanity that we inherited from fallen Adam. That's why he is called the last Adam, the second man, or is it the, 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 the second Adam, the last man? Why? He's starting a new humanity. He is restoring the humanity that Adam lost by redeeming us first of all. Now, having said that, um, I want us to, to combine this by looking like other men. I want to combine it with the last, uh, the last clause of the verse, which says, and by sharing in human nature. Now, for us to have a complete sense of what the Apostle Paul is saying here, I now need to migrate and look at, um, let's say, Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2. Um, we can start from about, uh, for completeness in our discussion, we can just start from about verse 9. Um but we see, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 to 14, but we see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, which means he really became a human being, but it was just for a little while to accomplish the mission of redemption. Now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by God's grace, he would experience death on behalf of everyone. In other words, he had to become a human being for him to die. God cannot die as God. He had to be a human being for him to be able to die. For it was fitting for him, for whom and through whom all things exist. Do you hear that? For whom and through whom all things exist. In other words, for whom means he is the possessor. He is the heir to all those things. Through whom means he is the agent by means of which all things exist. This is exactly what John 1.1 1, 1 says. In bringing men's sons to glory, to make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For indeed, that's verse 11 now, for indeed, he who makes you holy and those made holy all have the same origin. And so he is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. Again, he says, I will be confident in him. And again, here I am with the children God has given me. Now listen to verse 14 very carefully. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he likewise shared in their humanity so that through death, he could destroy the one who holds the power of death. That is the devil. Now, verse 14 has two important things that we must pay attention to. The first is children, because in the previous verse, he said, here I am with the children God has given me. So that's why verse 14 starts by saying, therefore, since the children, it's carrying on from the previous verse. The, ch the children share in flesh and blood, that is in humanity. We are all human beings. It doesn't matter whether you are a little babe, whether you are divorced, whether you are, you are widowed, whether you are an orphan, whether you are rich, whether you are poor, whether you are white, whether you are black, whether you are colored, whether you are Indian, whether you are Chinese. We can, our, our scheme, 
that is the outward appearance can vary from race to race and region to region but the essential thing which doesn't change is that we are human beings that is our nature flesh and blood now what is interesting is that the apostle paul uh, i'm assuming that paul wrote hebrews but it's disputed who wrote it um so so maybe let me just say the writer of the letter to the hebrews does something that i think people have not observed and sometimes it's the privilege we don't have of accessing the original text i have heard my most beloved brethren for example saying okay since children share in flesh and blood and he jesus christ also share in flesh and blood like them he is essentially identical to them but you see in philippians we were taught that he looked like other men he came in the likeness of men but there i showed you that if we do not forget that he was born of a virgin he was not born of a human father and a human a human mother coming together he was born of a virgin who was told by the angel gabriel in luke chapter 1 from our verse 28 onwards these words that holy thing which shall be conceived of thee shall be called the son of god notice that from birth he was called the holy thing he didn't have sin right now now here it's a pity that in the process of translation uh, somehow something very important is missed okay so let's read again i'm trying to read uh, verse 14 again in hebrews chapter 2 therefore since the children share in flesh and blood now the word share there or in other manuscripts like the king james version says the children partake now the word partake is used to mean we have communion we have fellowship in the same nature how do we get the nature we get it through human generation that is there is a father and a mother who come together and we get a share of that humanity which is fallen a fallen humanity so we partake of flesh and blood indeed we are human beings but how do we get this share of flesh and blood how do we share in it through human generation i want you to get hold of that point through human generation but how did he get to participate in this human nature he didn't get he didn't participate in this nature through human generation he didn't do that rather the holy spirit overshadowed mary and cleansed the and cleansed the and cleansed the in such a manner that that which was conceived in her was called the holy thing he 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 did not partake of this human nature of this flesh and blood in the same way that we do he didn't have a human father so what it means is that his humanity is the same as that of adam the original adam before he fell into sin whereas our humanity is the corrupted one which we inherited from our father adam do you see the point so he is truly human like us he is partaking in human nature like us 
but his humanity is not identical to ours in the sense that ours is fallen, his is holy. From the onset, he was that holy thing. Do you get the point? Now, it's interesting that um, if you are if you read the authorized version, which I think put it across very nicely, they understood because the Apostle Paul really used the two different words where he says the children part, are partakers of flesh and blood. The original word used there is different from the word that is used referring to how he also participates in this humanity. So, so the authorized version says, therefore, for as much as children, I'm just paraphrasing from my head, I don't have it here, but I've read it several times. Therefore, for as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise also took part of the same. So the difference between partaking and taking part, there are two different words in the original text. So, so why did the apostle use different words if, if the, the partaking is the same process, is, is of the same nature? Why did he use different words? You see the point I'm trying to emphasize. Now, what, what it really means is that he himself, the first thing that is being shown here, he himself already existed as divine. He has always existed in the form of God. But what he has done now is to add to himself humanity. It's not that he added divinity to humanity. He added humanity to his divinity because he always existed as divine. But at a particular point in time, which was described here as a short while, he was made a little lower than angels for a short while. For that short while, he added unto himself humanity. That's how he partakes of the human nature. But his is a human nature which does not have sin. It doesn't have corrupt propensities and habits and instincts. Ours is corrupted by sin because we inherited it from a fallen man, Adam. His is not corrupted. He added that humanity to himself. Why did you do that? So that by testing death for every one of us, He opens the door for our regeneration and our receiving from him a humanity that overcomes, if I may put it that way. But that humanity is not overcoming on its own. It is the grace of God working in it. It is the Spirit of God working in it. It is the Word of God working through it. Now, similarly, as I wind up, the Apostle Paul makes a reference to this issue of likeness because if we don't get it right, we, we might end up saying Jesus Christ was just like us in terms of everything. That's, that's what people often say. Oh, he was just like us in everything. Yes, he was, but there's a distinction. So, so you must be clear. That's correct teaching. You must be clear. Now, listen to Romans chapter 8, verse 3. Verse 3 starts by saying, <clears throat> For God achieved what the law could not do because it was weakened through the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and concerning sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Now, 
Let me read from the New American Standard Bible here. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Now, there are two things that can happen when you read this verse. Either you will misinterpret this verse and conclude that Jesus had a sinful human nature like we had. But that's not what this verse is saying. It says the law was weakened by this fallen human nature. In other words, even if the law is holy, true, and good, according to Romans chapter 7, Humanity could not keep that law because of the sin that dwelt in them. That very sin opposes the law. So the law could not achieve what it had to achieve, which was to make people holy. It could not make people holy and righteous. It could not save people. So, but God achieved that which the law failed to achieve. How? by sending his own son in the likeness of humanity, sinful flesh. That is us. That's, that's the point I was emphasizing in Philippians chapter 2, where, where it says he looked like other men or in the likeness of men and shared in their human nature. Similar in Hebrews, children part take of flesh and blood and he took part of the same now here is the point he came in our likeness but not in our form in the sense of having a fallen human nature he was like us so indeed if you look at the footnote at the footnotes that um translators give you they will show you that here, what, what, what likeness of sinful flesh means is he was truly a human being like us, but he did not have sin in him. Why? Because if he had sin, then he would have been disqualified from being a sacrifice for sin. Because here it says, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. So if he had sinned, then he would be disqualified from being a redeemer. That was going to happen. So, so in other words, what, 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 the, what, what the apostle is trying to show us is that he was truly human. But he, he had a nature which was not sinful. So then God used that perfect sacrifice to condemn sin. Now the word condemn here even implies that to take power away from sin. So that sin can no longer dominate us can no longer enslave us once we are born again and have entered into this new humanity that he gives us. Hallelujah. Um, so let me wind up my discussion by going back to Philippians chapter 2. Um, just summarizing what I said. I said in this verse, he emptied himself. And we said what he emptied himself of was not his divine nature, but the manifestations of that divine nature, the privileges of that divine nature are the things that he emptied himself of. 
Hence, he asks the Father to glorify him with the same glory that he shared with him before the creation of the universe. So, it's that glory which he had before everything was created, which he laid aside to come into this world of sin to save humanity as a truly, truly bond slave of God. And once he had done that, he reclaims that glory that he had laid aside. And that glory he laid aside is what he is said to have emptied himself of. Then we say that looking like other men, like they, is different from the word form. So form and like are different. Like is scheme, it's looking at the outward appearance, whereas form is the real substance, the underlying substance that, define, that defines a thing that does not change. It's unalterable. It doesn't change. It's unchangeable. It's immutable, right? So what we're saying is he looked like other men. He really truly had a body with all the features that we have and experience all the things that we experience. But the difference is he did not have a fallen nature like us. He had that original, uncorrupted, undefiled humanity that Adam had at creation before he fell into sin. So here, now I have a number of things from the first um, teaching to this one. First, that Jesus Christ is eternal and he has always existed as God and continues to do so and will continue to do so forever. And there is a distinction of persons which is clear here if we pay attention to language, equality with God is already implying a distinction of persons, but equality is with reference to the form, that is, he has the being of God. So, since he has that nature of being God, and God the Father has that nature of being God, they are equal in the sense of having that nature of being God in equal proportions, if I can put it that way. So, so here, there's a distinction of persons. Then the issue of emptying himself is not referring to the form, but the privileges of that form. The form of being God had the glories that went with it or that go with it. These glories are the things that Christ emptied himself of completely. But he remained God, only that he voluntarily chose not to exercise those glories or which attached to his being God. And he truly, truly became a human being who was a bond slave of Yahweh the Father. And he looked like us in every sense, everything we experienced. The only difference is his humanity was the original humanity Adam had, which did not have sin. Whereas we have the humanity we got from Adam, which is a, a fallen humanity. So he was like us in every sense, truly human like us. But the difference is his instincts, his, his passions, his feelings, everything else were not corrupted or polluted by sin. It was a true Humanity. Remember that sin is not a relevant aspect of humanity, but to us it is because we inherit that polluted human nature. Now, 
So that's where we end. So clearly, Jesus was fully God. He was fully human. And all this he did so that he might ransom us by offering himself as a ransom for mankind. We thank you, Father, for allowing us this opportunity to share your word and to grow thereby. Bless this word to our hearts. Sanctify us by your word, for thy word is truth. Make us grow in knowing thee, in Jesus' name. Amen.